and now it should behave. So can you all see my screen? Yes, all good. Can you see my cursor? Yes. Wonderful. So um, the motivation for my talk is, stems from the fact that uh, the leading cause of disability today is neurological disorders. There are over 270 million uh, disability adjusted life years, as it's called in the, in the uh, uh, medical lingo, lost to neurological disorders in 2016. This was the last year for which complete set of data exists. Stroke is leading the way, but uh, uh, disorders such as migraine, dementias, epilepsy or so um, uh, follow. And the, um, the news from the uh, pharmaceutical companies is actually uh, pretty bad. There is a trend which was baptized Irum's law, which stands for Moore's law spelled backwards. Um, that uh, states that the discovery of new drugs is becoming more um, uh, expensive and as a result slower as a function of time. So this plot here shows the number of drugs that you get per billion of US dollars and of course it's adjusted uh, over time um, and it, it decreases below one um, currently. So this is not going to provide the, the solution to uh, neurological disorders. The good news comes from a field which is called bioelectronic medicine, and it involves using implantable devices that stimulate the brain. This is one example uh, called a deep brain stimulator that is shown here. This is a device that is implanted uh, deep in the brain in a, in a structure called the subthalamic nucleus. And by flicking a switch, it can um, have life-changing effects um, in movement disorders, in dystonia, Parkinson's, uh, uh, in resting tremor, um, and also being used for neuropsychological uh, uh, disorders such as OCD, depression, and even for obesity is being uh, trialed out. Um, this follows on a, a long history that goes back to the 60s where the uh, first, um, actually late 50s, where the first cardiac pacemakers for treating arrhythmias were implanted, um, which today is a device that it's implanted through a fairly routine operation to about 600,000 recipients per year. In the 70s, we had cochlear implants for restoration of hearing. Again, um, a fairly standard uh, device uh, today. Spinal cord stimulators for pain, uh, vagus nerve stimulation for epilepsy, uh, sacral nerve stimulator for bladder control, deep brain stimulators uh, for Parkinson's, for OCD, and then a couple of other prosthetic devices, by no means an exhaustive uh, list. This is taking off um, in a highly super linear trend. And it has become so significant that it has captured the attention of some high flyers in the technology world, including uh, Google, who, whose parent company came into an agreement with a pharmaceutical company to launch uh, Galvani Bioelectronics, as it's called, aiming to treat disease, not through drugs, but through implantable stimulators. Um, Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla and SpaceX, got into the game, and so did the founder of uh, Facebook. So this creates a lot of expectation, um, and there is increasing commercial interest. Um, but where are we really? Um, there are significant limitations of this technology today. First and foremost, we do not understand how the brain works. The human brain contains over 80 billion neurons that are connected in uh, networks uh, and networks of networks. And although we understand how a neuron gets uh, excited, generates a response, which is called the action potential, how that travels down the action and then either excites or inhibits the postsynaptic neuron. We do not understand how this behavior at the neuronal level 
leads to behavior in the organism level? How do we go from a, an assembly of neurons to microscopic behavior? We also do not understand the mechanism of neuromodulation. What really happens when we excite these neurons in the brain through an implantable electrode? Um, in order to understand this, uh, we are using electrodes that are placed uh, in a clinical setting, either on the uh, scalp, we're talking here about electroencephalography, or on the surface of the brain, in which case we have electrocorticography, or implanted into the brain, in which case we talk about stereotaxic electroencephalography or depth probing. By using these techniques, we can uh, begin to understand more about the communication of neurons and correlate it with behavior, and then reverse the, the problem and stimulate while we observe changes in behavior. Now, there are also formidable technological limitations here. The signals that are recorded from the brain are small, and the environment in the brain is very hostile to electronics. Consider this a piece of silicon inserted in the brain will etch uh, through oxidation and hydrolysis to the tune of about a micron a month. So it's a highly corrosive environment uh, inside our bodies for electronics. The uh, placement of electronics is a highly invasive process both for the brain and for the electronics. And often multiple surgeries are required to replace corroded leads or, or batteries. So new technologies are needed to address these limitations and then promote a better understanding of the brain, which will enable uh, the field of bioelectronics medicine to flourish. The points that I want to make uh, uh, at my talk today is I want to show you how you can teach electronics a foreign language, how you can um, teach an electrode um, to communicate better with neurons. And we do this by using materials that are called mixed electronic ionic conductors. How to get drug into the brain is another topic that I want to highlight today. We use a process called electrophoresis, and I will explain what that is, to enable precise delivery uh, behind the blood-brain barrier. And in this case, uh, repurpose drugs that would otherwise not work for neurological disorders. And then I'll show you a couple of slides on implants that can change shape and decrease the invasiveness of neurosurgery. So another way to frame the discussion on bioelectronics is to consider it as the interfacing between two worlds in which uh, the properties are very different. For example, in the brain, in the world of biology in general, and in the brain, we deal with materials that are mostly soft. While electronics in their traditional um, uh, configuration, they're made out of mechanically stiff materials. So, so there is this mechanical properties mismatch. Um, the language spoken in biology, uh, the communication between cells, between tissues, between organs is very complex and involves anything from uh, small uh, metal ions, sodium, potassium, all the way to whole pieces of cells being exchanged in the form of uh, vesicles, um, and often is not very well understood. While in the world of electronics, the communication between these two components takes place by exchanging an electron flux, something we understand in a quantitative fashion. Biological systems are dynamic, they evolve as a function of time, while electronics in their traditional, um, again, configuration are static. So the last decade, there has been tremendous uh, progress in making electronics into mechanical form factors that interface well with biology. So we have electronics that are made very thin, even flexible and stretchable, so that they can be placed on the brain without causing any mechanical loading. So I would claim that the mechanical properties uh, uh, mismatch has been bridged. And today a lot of action uh, happens in the communications gap. So we need to establish communication by, in a bi-directional fashion so that information from biology is effect effectively translated 
into um, electronics for diagnosis purposes. And in the opposite way, we can actuate processes in biology through electronic control to deliver treatment. So I'll tell you about that. Um, and I will frame the discussion in the context of epilepsy. Monitoring the brain uh, in epileptic patients is extremely important, not only for diagnosing the uh, uh, epilepsy, but also for treating, for subsequent treating. About 1% of the world population has epilepsy, so recurrent uh, uh, seizures, and about 30% of uh, uh, epileptic patients are drug resistant. Now, in cases where there is severe epilepsy and drug resistance, resective surgery is the next treatment option. There, the part of the brain that gives rise to um, uh, the seizures is localized, and it's localized by placing electrodes in different parts of the brain, as shown in this example. These are implantable electrodes that penetrate into the brain and measure electrical activity in order to localize the origin of a seizure um, so that the surgeon can then resect it. Um, if you try to do this by using traditional semiconductors, and I bring here the example of silicon, which is the, the most uh, uh, common electronic material today, or the most celebrated, um, what you're trying to do at the interface is you're trying to um, link ionic carriers in a liquid, the, the cerebrospinal uh, fluid, and this would be the ionic carriers that are set to motion through neuronal activity. So ions such as sodium, potassium, and so on. Um, you're trying to link this and make them communicate with electronic carriers in the solid material. Now, if you try to do this with silicon, you run to the problem that you have typically an oxide or a nitride protecting silicon from the corrosive environment. And this spaces away the two carriers and decreases their interaction. If you use a metal, um, a noble metal such as uh, gold, platinum, then you don't have that barrier layer. And you arrive at a situation where you have ions on one side of the interface and electrons on the other. And as such, you have a coupling along a two-dimensional plane. You form a capacitor and the coupling between ionics and electronics is described by the so-called double layer capacitance, which has a universal uh, value between one and 10 microfarad per square centimeters, regardless of what material you use, as long as you have a flat surface. So this parameter here defines the coupling between the two worlds, the strength of communication, and there's very little you can do to, to change it. However, if you arrange it so that you use a material uh, such as this conducting polymer that I show here, I'm not going to get into any details of chemical structures, just consider this as a, as a gooey uh, uh, porous semiconductor in which ions can penetrate into the volume. Then you arrive at a situation where you have coupling of electronic and ionic carriers now in the volume of the material as opposed to just at the surface. As a result, you can have couplings that by far exceed this, this limit here. And that enables you to, to deliver state-of-the-art devices or um, envision novel type of uh, uh, responses. For example, you can time reverse the process shown here. And under electrical stimulation, you can have your uh, polymer electrode deliver ions uh, of drugs into the brain. Now, one slide with uh, chemical structures and then, then we move on. Um, there is a very small difference in the structure of these two molecules. Um, there are just some oxygen uh, uh, atoms here on the side chain, but this makes a world of difference. This material uh, behaves in the same fashion as a flat metal film. It doesn't allow ions to penetrate its structure. While the um, addition of these oxygen atoms in the side chain changes completely the behavior and allows penetration of ions into the whole volume and increases in capacitance. So 
with this material, we have unique degrees of freedom. We can engineer the response um, of the material. And we're learning now how to deliver materials that give this volumetric conduction of ions in order to enhance the coupling between ionics and electronics. The end result of this exercise is shown here. This is an ideal volumetric conductor. It's a commercial conducting polymer, which is called P.PSS. And the manifestation of this um, uh, phenomenon um, is shown here. You end up having a capacitance which scales linearly with the volume of the film. So the thicker you make the film, the better the coupling between ionic and electronic carriers. Just to give you an order of magnitude estimate, if you make a film out of this material that is just 130 nanometers uh, uh, thick, then you end up having an effective capacitance per unit area that is two orders of magnitude larger than what you would get from a metal electrode of the same uh, dimensions. Which means that now you can decrease the size of your electrode, make it two orders of magnitude smaller, and still be able to record with the same signal to noise ratio. So this thin coating on top of a gold electrode just allows you to gain two orders of magnitude in spatial resolution. And it allows unprecedented uh, uh, spatial resolution in neural recordings. So this is the, the situation I described earlier. These are small islands of uh, uh, the conducting polymer that have been introduced on top of gold electrodes. Their size is typical to, uh, typically of the order of tens of microns, which is the size of the soma of a neuron in the, uh, in the brain. And this can be introduced in very thin polymer membranes that are uh, very flexible and provide no mechanical loading uh, when placed on the surface of the brain. They're very flexible, they can follow the curvature. So you see here uh, the array of electrodes placed on, the, on an orchid leaf, um, giving you radio of curvatures that are compatible with structures in the brain. Now, when these were tried on the cortex of a rat, they were able to record spikes. This, uh, uh, this uh, spikes indicated here correspond to single neuron activity captured from the surface of the brain. Now, one thing I didn't tell you earlier is that the, the, the neuronal signals that emanate at the surface of the brain are extremely small and are very difficult to capture. It was actually predicted that it would be impossible to capture those given uh, technology uh, limitations. But with these magical coatings on top that allow you a much stronger coupling between electronics and ionics, you can now make small electrodes that can resolve these activities. Um, this was a technology that was um, uh, fast track to the clinic because again, it provided a, a, an advantage to other recording technologies. You could record not only the global activity that emanates at the, the surface of the brain. This is the so-called local field potential, which is the chatter of many, many neurons, but also these spikes which correspond to individual neurons uh, close to these uh, electrodes, just under the surface of the brain here, uh, being uh, recorded. So it allows unprecedented resolution in uh, um, recordings of the human brain without penetrating the, the cortex. Um, you can do even better uh, than this by using a device which is a bit more uh, complicated. And, and the argument goes as follows. Let me scroll through the, uh, the formulas here. And, and it's rather uh, simple. So if you have an electrode in proximity with the brain, you will record not only the signal, which is the activity that, that you're after, but a whole uh, bunch of uh, biological noise, which corresponds to activities of other neurons that um, are a bit further away from the electrode and, and you get their spatiotemporal summation. Now, as the signal is transported to your amplifier, 
um, you pick up some noise uh, because this transmission line here um, acts as an antenna and picks up uh, signals from cell phone towers, from uh, the anesthesia equipment, and so on and so forth. So your amplifier here will amplify everything, signal, noise, biological noise, and extrinsic noise. And this factor degrades your signal-to-noise ratio. Now, if you move your amplifier close to the origin of the signal, you're going to amplify signal and biological noise, but not amplify any noise you pick up uh, down the line, the transmission line. So you'll end up having a higher signal-to-noise ratio, all things being equal. So this and other arguments um, motivated people uh, such as Peter Fromherz at the Max Planck Institute to devote their career to develop transistors, high-end transistors, that record from neurons in, in culture. And again, here you have the same situation where you have ions on one side of the interface and electronic carriers in the channel of the, uh, the silicon transistor here coupling through a dielectric. So it's a, it's a planar configuration, plus they're spaced away because of a dielectric. So their interaction is weak, and this translates into suboptimal performance. In the 80s, there was a transistor that was developed by uh, Mark Wrighton's group at that time at MIT, that uses a, an organic semiconductor in direct contact with an electrolyte, so without uh, 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 an insulator, a barrier layer uh, separating the two. And if this semiconductor is such that allows ions to penetrate through its volume, then you can get exceptionally good coupling between ions and electrons. And this translates into amplifications that were unheard of in the world of traditional electronics. Um, what I'm showing you here is the so-called transfer curve uh, here in black that describes how much do you change the electronic current that flows through the transistor, which is the output of your uh, transducer, as a function of the voltage that the transistor sees at the gate. And in a neuronal recording configuration, this would be the voltage um, uh, that, that would drive the, uh, the transistor. So you want this curve to be as steep as possible. Um, and the first derivative of this uh, uh, curve is shown here in green, is called the transconductance, that measures the steepness of this curve. And you want it to be as high as possible. So a small wiggle in voltage will be translated into a large change in current. Um, these transistors um, can have performances that are easily 100 times higher than you can get with the best uh, state-of-the-art silicon transistor of the same uh, dimensions. And they do this by just coupling better ionics and electronics through the, through the field. So when, I, when applied into a, 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 an experimental configuration where you measure uh, activity because of seizures, from the cortex as shown here. Um, so here you have an array of uh, electrodes and transistors sitting on the cortex of a, a rat that is a model for uh, uh, epileptic activity. And you're recording seizures here with the electrode that's already optimized. It's, it's a very good electrode. And then with a transistor, all things being equal, the two uh, signals um, uh, normalize for the same uh, quantity of noise you see that you end up having a much better uh, recording uh, here, which allows you to observe now new, new phenomena that you wouldn't be able to resolve here and speed up the, uh, uh, the, uh, phase, the, 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 the pace of neurological uh, um, research. Um, it also allows you to become less invasive. These are recordings. Um, here are the raw data and here are so-called time frequency analysis of the data that shows you uh, the frequency components in this signal as it, as it is being recorded by using three transducers. One is a transistor, 
uh, as I showed you earlier, that is sitting at the surface of the brain. Here is an electrode that's sitting at the surface of the brain. And here is an electrode that has been pushed inside the brain. It's a depth electrode. This is obviously invasive. And it sits very close to the origin of this activity. And of course, it resolves it very nicely. You see the frequency components here uh, very clearly. And this is what is used in the clinic for diagnosis purposes. As this activity uh, projects to the surface of the brain, it weakens. And as a result, the surface electrode isn't able to resolve it very well. However, the transistor gains some of this uh, lost signal and can be useful in, uh, uh, in resolving these activities by being much less invasive than a depth electrode. Now, what makes the transistor uh, a good transducer is the transconductance, as I mentioned earlier. And in these devices, you can change the transconductance by just increasing the thickness of the channel. If you make your polymer layer thicker, you have more ions going in, you have a stronger coupling between these and uh, electronic carriers. So you can reach any amplification you want by making the transistor thicker. However, this doesn't come for free. It gets slower. As you make the transistor thicker, its response time degrades. So you have the well-known trade-off between uh, bandwidth and amplification. The higher the amplification, the lower the bandwidth. But this now you can tune by just adjusting the thickness of the transistor and you can uh, optimize it regardless of the footprint of the transistor on your wafer. So you can still make very small electrode and tune electrodes and tune their response to the right uh, uh, part of the uh, application spectrum. This is shown here. These are two transistors that have the same footprint on the, on the sample. One is uh, made out of a thick uh, channel, the other thin. The one on with the uh, thin channel can push out to higher frequencies, but you get a, a loss of amplification. On the other hand, the thick transistor loses in terms of bandwidth, but gains in terms of amplification. And in this particular case, we're after alpha rhythms, which is the uh, uh, which have frequencies that are fairly low, of the order of, of, of the order of uh, tens of uh, hertz. Um, and as a result, this is the transistor that you want. You you don't care about the extra bandwidth. You can sacrifice this to get a bit more uh, oomph, a bit more amplification. And the difference in power between the two recordings is uh, 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 just shows you that uh, this you can navigate successfully this trade-off. This is a super high resolution recording um, that uh, goes well beyond what you can do with uh, traditional electrodes. Now, so, so far I've been talking about recording uh, and recording ionic signals that come from the activity of neurons. And by using mixed conductors, I showed you that you can couple these ionic signals with electronic ones in the bulk of a, a, a semiconductor and achieve um, high recording efficiencies. Now I want to um, talk about the opposite process of how you can use electronics to send ionic signals into the brain. And this is again in the context of epilepsy. As I mentioned earlier, the first line of defense uh, uh, against epilepsy is anti-epileptic drugs, typically anticonvulsants um, that were first, uh, let me do a quick time check, yeah, that were first developed in the, um, um, in the 50s or so, and um, they offer uh, about, they offer coverage to about 70% of patients. There is this 30% of patients which just do not respond to this for reasons that are uh, unknown. There are also side effects uh, that are elicited by these uh, drugs. 
So in the case where there is drug resistance or the side effects are too severe and epilepsy is uh, uh, disabling, uh, resective surgery localizing the part of the brain that gives rise to uh, seizures and removing it is the next uh, treatment option. However, in several patients who would be candidates for this surgery, uh, this surgery is not performed. And the reason is that the uh, epileptogenic zone um, overlaps with an area of the brain um, that gives high functionality. For example, the eloquent cortex or uh, other areas that would make the risk versus benefit trade-off not pan out. Um, in these cases, there is very little uh, uh, that can be done to help the patient. So what we're advocating is the implantation of a device in the epileptogenic zone um, that releases drug locally when and where is needed. So just before the seizure arises, if you were able to, uh, to provide a drug here, um, that would um, probably be a good uh, treatment option. Now, here we're inside the brain, hence past what is called the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier uh, blocks about 98% of drugs that we have available today from reaching the brain. So by being behind that, all of a sudden you have a much larger gamut of drugs that you can try including some drugs that would be very powerful anti-epileptics, were they able to cross this blood-brain barrier. Moreover, because you are uh, applying very small quantities of drugs compared to systemic administration, you can expect much fewer side effects. So this is a very attractive proposition. And such drug delivery past the blood-brain barrier has been um, tried in the case of brain tumors, for example, past resection of a tumor in order to kill the remaining uh, cancer cells. Um, people use either uh, devices or materials that are infused with drugs and can release it for a little bit of time after the, uh, the surgery, or catheters that can supply a solution of the drug in this uh, uh, target area. Um, there are good reasons why these concepts will not work in epilepsy. They're not suitable for a chronic application. Uh, and quite frankly, they don't work very well in the case of, uh, of tumors as well. This uh, convection enhanced delivery, as it's called, where you uh, uh, source a solution of drug into the brain causes pressure-induced edemas and suffer from reflow of the drug next to the catheter, delivering uh, effectively an unknown amount of drug into the brain. So we were very excited when we saw a paper uh, about 10 years ago um, that uh, uh, describes a process which is called dry delivery. So here, you use a mixed conductor, a material such as the one that I mentioned earlier, from which we make the, uh, the electrodes and the transistors, to transport a drug from one reservoir to another. And this transport process takes place by a mechanism that is called electrophoresis. That means you take this uh, ion uh, through a material by applying an electric field. As such, you only transport the drug and not the solvent. And as a result, you don't have reflux of the, uh, of the drug solution or pressure-induced edemas that plague convection and has delivered. This is something that was uh, discovered and developed by uh, scientists at Linköping University and Karolinska Institute and they applied it in an in vivo model of a, a guinea pig to show that you can regulate uh, the hearing uh, by, um, uh, by delivering an, a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. So the way these devices work is they have a reservoir that contains a drug solution, which is called the source reservoir, and it's separated by the brain by a membrane 
a membrane that contains fixed ionic charge, so ions that are tethered chemically to a polymer chain and cannot move. As such, when you apply a potential between the, uh, the inside and the outside, you get your uh, drug ions, which are indicated here in red, being transported through the membrane and delivered to the brain, while the fixed anionic charge on the membrane makes sure that anions from the brain are blocked and do not uh, get extracted. So this is a unidirectional uh, 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 process for delivering ions from the source to the target and not the other way around. So we engineer devices that contain fluidic channels that bring the drug, the drug solution into the brain and then uh, uh, take it out again. And right at the tip, um, this is the, 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 the finished device, right at the tip we have, uh, we poked holes in the microfluidic uh, uh, channel and cut them with a membrane that um, allows the transport only of the drug and not the solvent when we apply a potential. We also put sensors to measure local electrical activity. And with these devices, you can increase dramatically the concentration uh, uh, of a drug into the brain by just applying a very small potential. As a drug here, we use a, a neurotransmitter um, that is in, um, uh, native to the brain, it's called GABA, and it represents the break signals of, uh, uh, for neurons to stop firing. So by applying just half a volt on this device, we can go from uh, a concentration that is native inside the brain to a concentration that is several orders of magnitude higher and has a very strong therapeutic uh, uh, effect. Um, this is shown in, um, uh, in an animal model for epilepsy, where what we can do is we can kindle a seizure and then let it manifest itself. This is the uh, situation where the device is implanted but is not turned on. And you can see that um, by, um, by having the device there, it has no influence in the brain. The, the, the seizure just manifests itself. Now here, we kindle the seizure, we let it manifest, and as soon as it does, we turn on the device. So we start del delivering GABA here, and the seizure immediately uh, stops. What you see here is spikes. These spikes correspond to an electrical artifact that we pick up because we're pulsing the drug delivery. We're sending, sending little puffs of GABA into the region of the brain that gives rise to seizures. And here is another experiment where we start uh, puffing uh, GABA and then we kindle the seizure. We try to kindle the seizure and the seizure just doesn't materialize itself. So uh, not only it can stop, but it can also prevent uh, a seizure from uh, arising. We have demonstrated in a closed loop uh, in vitro model where we could record uh, 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 seizures, uh, predict, uh, record electrical activity, predict seizure, and then um, start the delivery before um, actually uh, the seizure manifests itself and prevent it from uh, being manifested. Now, this was the case for epilepsy. Um, you might want to use the device also in other conditions and brain tumors come to mind. It's a, it's a, a, a situation where there is a dire need for local uh, chemotherapy devices. And the treatment requirements can be uh, widely different for different neurological uh, uh, conditions. For example, for epilepsy, you're talking about a device that uh, is implanted for the life of the patient, while for brain tumors, typically you want to deliver treatment uh, for a couple of weeks. Um, On-off ratio is important because this device needs to be only on just before a seizure arrives. 
Um, while for brain tumors, you want to turn the device on, just deliver, deliver chemotherapy to the tumor and then remove the, the device after that. Small amounts are required here, were very large here and so on and so forth. So the, the point that I'm trying to make is that not one size fits all. And we needed to develop uh, uh, tools to allow us to engineer these devices for different treatment scenarios. Um, this is the outcome of a process. And uh, these are phase diagrams that show the efficiency of a particular process as a function of the amount of charge on the membrane um, and on the uh, drug reservoir. And you can tune the amount of drug transported, the pumping efficiency, how much drug you pump versus the reflow um, of uh, uh, ions into the device. And then the on-off ratio. And the point that I want to make is that there's not one regime that optimizes all parameters. So you need to choose for a treatment scenario, a particular treatment scenario, and engineer your device accordingly. So currently we're working on making devices that deliver uh, chemotherapy to non-resectable uh, tumors, implantable devices. And the biggest issue there was to show that you can cover fairly large areas. These tumors can be quite massive. Um, and um, uh, early results indicate that we can easily address voxels of the order of several centimeters. Uh, in, uh, this is in an in vitro model of the brain by using this uh, technique. So very promising results also for the case of tumors. Now, in the final um, uh, few minutes, I want to talk about the, uh, the last bridge that we have to cross. How can we make devices that address um, uh, this discontinuity? The fact that the situation here is dynamic, things evolve, change shape, while electronics are static. And this is motivated by the fact that um, neural surgery is quite brutal. This is the placement of a cortical array. And what you need to do is you need to do a massive craniotomy that exposes the, the, the brain here. Uh, you can see it here. This is the, the bone and this is the brain. And then uh, cut the dura, which is a, a membrane that encloses and protects the brain and slide your electrode array underneath. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could slide an array of electrodes in through a small hole and then expand it without having to do a massive craniotomy. And a similar uh, problem um, arises in spinal cord, the placement of spinal cord electrodes, um, where you would have to do a laminectomy, which is quite a, a, a brutal procedure. If you could insert an electrode array through a spinal tap, that would be highly desirable. So, um, Getting inspiration from the field of soft robotics, uh, we design devices that are uh, flexible, they carry electronics, and at the same time have microfluidic channels that can be activated to achieve different types of uh, motion. For example, we can get unrolling in one direction to expand the implant uh, uh, forward, or in two dimensions as shown here to uh, unfold an implant in the brain. And this is shown here in an in vitro model, an implant that can be uh, collapsed and inserted through a needle um, into the body and then unrolled to become a puddle electrode. And as it does, it maintains its electrical uh, properties. So this uh, is shown in, the, in a human cadaver, uh, unrolling an implant into the spinal cord. And again, this, to, to, uh, this is implanted through a spinal uh, tap-like uh, procedure, while it would normally require a, a, a laminectomy. Um, and this is shown um, in the brain. These lines here are markers that show the edges of the implant when it's uh, fully implanted. This is in the cortex of a cadaver, of a human cadaver. And there was just a small burr hole that allowed the implantation of the rolled implant. And then it's unrolling to cover 
quite uh, large area. So we're very excited about uh, this data. It's, it's early times, but um, it, it shows a lot of promise. So with that, I will stop and um, just remind you of the main points of, of the talk, that implantable electronics in what is called bioelectronic medicine today hold considerable promise for understanding the brain and addressing uh, a neurological disorder. Uh, mixed conductors enable very high resolution cortical recordings that record single neurons without penetrating the brain, something that was considered uh, not possible. It's possible because we have now materials that can mix electrons and ions to their volume. These same materials enable transistors that record with record high signal to noise ratios. You can use these processes also to deliver drug in the brain through electrophoresis. And because you're past the blood brain barrier, you can deliver a much larger gamut of drugs that would normally not cross the barrier. You also deliver at small quantities, so you avoid uh, uh, toxicity issues. As such, we have shown that these devices can either stop or prevent seizures. This is in an animal model, hasn't been translated, but hopefully it will. And then I show you how by um, coupling microfluidics with uh, flexible implants, you can make implants that change shape and minimize the invasiveness of uh, neurosurgery. This will hopefully uh, go into patients in the not so distant future. So with that, I would like to, uh, to thank my group, our many collaborators, both in Cambridge and uh, uh, outside, uh, funding agencies that funded this research, um, the organizers for uh, the kind invitation, and you for your attention. So I'll stop here and uh, take your questions.